Uh, my name is Shazira. I am the Asia Pacific Program Officer for an organization based in Geneva, Switzerland. It's called Association for Prevention of Torture. Um, we work globally to support uh, government agencies, national human rights institutions, and civil society organizations in their efforts to prevent torture. So it could be reforming the law, uh, building capacities of authorities, uh, organizing campaigns uh, on the grassroots level. So um, we try to tailor our support and response to the issues uh, as much as we can to the national context and needs. And I think this is how um, APT has been working all this while. Um, I manage the Asia Pacific program, which means that I cover all the work, um, you know, from between Maldives uh, to Mongolia <laughs> somewhat. Um, and we do have priority countries where we have a much uh, longer long-term cooperation with national actors. So that is just to give you a bit of insight on, the, on my work. The way we work is we always focus on the fact that um, the risk of torture exists everywhere. Uh, and of course, um, because of historically how APT was founded and our um, uh, aim is always to ensure that detention places are open to uh, independent scrutiny. Hence, uh, that was the very reason why we were, you know, established in the first place. So um, the way we work is ultimately is to ensure that detention places are open for independent monitoring from an independent national body. So in that sense, we work closely with national human rights institutions that uh, have a mandate to uh, inspect or conduct uh, visits to detention places. Um, we also work with uh, law enforcement authorities in some countries. Uh, when we um, you know, see there is an opening for us to offer support in terms of building capacity or understanding about uh, new techniques or methods that they can use uh, in their work, for instance, investigation, um, how to, you know, to ensure that safeguards are being given to or being afforded to persons deprived of liberty during the first hour of custody. So these are some of the areas that we also work uh, in the country. And we always, you know, uh, the way we work, we always try to breach as, as much opinion and different partners on the ground, which means that we just don't work with um, one partner like the government agency or the NHRI. We also try to work with human rights defenders as much as we can because um, they are the important uh, people on the ground who, who work directly with persons um, whose rights are affected. Uh, so they're also one of our key partners. And we do all these consultations, um, engagement uh, on a long-term basis, which means that we don't just go and do a one-off activity, but we really value the importance of continuing the discussion and the cooperation with national actors. But at the end of the day, is also to actually allow the national actors to have ownership of what they're doing or you know what what they're doing so while we come in and do the support work and, and do the consultation and engagement we also want to ensure that national actors um, benefit the most out of all these activities and they also will run the activities on their own at the end so this is um, some of the ways when i say that um, we try to work as much as we can close to the context and needs of, of the partners on the ground uh, yes, indeed. Um, the, 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 I think there is different level of openness, absolutely. And of course, we, we understand this as the different dynamics and how people perceive the whole, um, you know, work around torture prevention. Uh, for instance, um, of course, we have a lot of government agencies who might still be uncomfortable or not open enough to... Um, you know, to, to work on these issues with us. Um, but we we always manage to find like um, one focal point or people or ministry 
who, who are willing to, um, to discuss these issues with us and to give us that opening. But of course, when you work with the human rights defenders, um, they're more than happy to, um, you know, to cooperate and to also bring more insights to, into the work that we're doing because they, they have this direct connection and, and, and experience of dealing on these issues. In fact, they themselves are being subjected to, you know, to some of these uh, act of torture or ill treatment. So um, we, we, we can definitely see there are different levels of engagement. And the way we work is because we've always been transparent and we put dialogue and cooperation as a key to our way of working. I think in, in some, some contexts, it's really working well because um, people are more welcoming and maybe see that, you know, there's an opportunity to have a safe space to talk about quite a difficult issue. And because we don't deal on individual cases, uh, which we always believe that, you know, human rights defenders are working on individual cases, and this is definitely uh, very valuable to the work on tort torture prevention, but we don't. We work more on uh, supporting efforts for long-term structural change. So I think the methods of our work uh, and our mandate as an organization also help us to build that trust and give us that opening to talk to um, different groups of people in the country that we work in. I think because torture always happened in the most uh, secret, you know, uh, secretive, most discreet place. I mean, people don't openly um, commit torture. Yeah. Um, hence why we need to shine a light on this issue and hence why there need to be more transparency on how we deal with the issue, how we document it. And I think that's why, um, and that's, that's always been our motto. And um, that's also the reason in some situations in the region where um, there is a fear of, you know, of, of the work done by the human rights defender to expose more of these abuses, because it means that there are more and more of these actions are being put out there in public um, and expose, um, you know, the, the problem of accountability trans and transparency from the law enforcement authorities and the state themselves. So I think this is why it's very important um, for documentation of human rights abuses or allegations needs to be done in a transparent way and hence why we also always emphasize to be transparent in our um, work as well um, with others uh, in this area. Uh, I think the, the practices are still widespread in some countries. Um, I mean, you can look at the annual reports released by NGOs or human rights organizations like Amnesty International. They've done once a global report or a global study on the issue. Uh, Human Rights Watch as well. In fact, we, APT, we've done um, ourselves a research um, that looked into the situation of torture prevention in uh, 16 countries around the world. And two of the countries that were studied uh, is are Indonesia and Philippines, which is two countries that we are working in. And um, the, the problem of the use of torture, the risk of torture, we like to call it the risk of torture because to us, when you talk about prevention, it's about eliminating the risk. The risk of torture is highly likely uh, during some, um, you know, there's a broad spectrum of where it can happen, but it's highly likely to occur during the first hour of police custody. This is where, you know, uh, a, a person, uh, a suspect, for instance, are being apprehended by a police officer and taken to a police station for an investigation. And this is the most sensitive time where where torture can occur during the interrogation, during the transfer, uh, you know, during the screening of the person at the lockup. So because of this, this is, and, and a lot of the cases sort of um, corroborated with this finding in, this, in the study that this is the, the most sensitive time where torture can happen. And the act of torture during this time is, is, is that being done by the law enforcement, of course, for, for a multiple reasons, but mostly to extract confession from persons deprived of liberty, to get them to, uh, to say, you know, uh, 
what um, you know to 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 get them to say what they <laughs> they might not do, they might not do, but for them in order for them to um, to stop the pain, they might just confess or agree to what being put forth to them. So this is we find this, and you can see this happening, um, you know, uh, in 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 Philippines. In Indonesia, in India, for instance, India is also another country that's covered in the study. This occurrence uh, you can see happening, and in fact, the second finding, which is interesting, also is the practice of secret cells or uh, secret cells where it's unofficial places where people are being kept um, after they are being apprehended. And um, there's also high likelihood for torture to take place in secret cells. And for instance. Um, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, the National Human Rights Commission of Philippines found the wheel of torture uh, in, in one of the uh, police lockup in the Philippines, where they actually use the wheel to sort of decide what sort of torture or ill treatment that they will, you know, conduct or, or, or do against um, the person, the detainee, uh, that were detained in a secret cell. So. This is some of just to give you some of the instances um, of you know of of acts of torture uh, that are taking place in the region, but we don't have to see all that before we start taking action or measures. I think we need to just look at the symptoms and just to look at the risk and try to address that before it gets to the level where torture occurs. And, and that, I think, is, 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 is important in our work. Um, I'll give you an example when we talk about risk here. For instance, an overcrowded prison means that, you know, um, that you will get a prison full of um, detainees that you need to monitor and you have just one police officer, or, sorry, one prison warden to take care of the whole prison, for instance. And that in itself, you know, poses a risk for torture to occur or for ill treatment to occur. Because at the end of the day, the law enforcement, they are human beings. So in that situation, more often than not, they're going to be using um, physical uh, aggression or as a method to control, you know, the mob or, or the situation in the prison, in the overcrowded prison. And this is just an example of a risk. So what can be done in this case is how we make sure for instance prisons should not be overcrowded we shouldn't you know allow the prisons to be um you know to 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 have more than what the capacity allows we shouldn't have uh children being put together in with the adult uh detainees for instance or there should be a segregated women and children from uh, men or adult um, offenders, for instance, these are measures that you could use to ensure that um, you know we could curb the risk of torture from occurring in a detention place. Um, another instance that I just want to share here is, of course, um, on the methods of interrogation. Now, police officers are known to use very aggressive uh, methods of interrogation to extract confession, and this happened a lot in the confession-based system. Countries of confession-based system see the need to have um, detainees, you know, to confess to a certain offense because it fulfill their, their job performance index or, you know, what they're aiming for, and they will do anything they can just to do that. So in this regard, you know, um, using aggression or coercion or maybe physical um, means to get to extract confession has been in the culture, the working culture, or the technique that the police only know how to do their work with. So what is needed there, for instance, is actually to introduce a more human method of interviewing. So now we see there's more and more trend uh, of, uh, it's still new and more needs to be done, I think, in terms of seeing whether, um, this method of interviewing can be um, um, taught to more police officers. But now there is this new method called investigative interviewing, for instance, uh, which hopefully would provide 
the needed skill for police officers to conduct their investigation more efficiently without resorting to torture and ill treatment. Um, there are a pool of uh, police officers that have been trained in the region. It's still a very, very new initiative. But, you know, these are some of the measures that we could explore and see um, as, as, as preventive measures, I think, to curb torture. Um, I think civil society, especially in the region, we have really strong, this is the, this is the thing, we have really strong civil society organizations, but struggling in their work because of the shrinking space <laughs> for them to work. Uh, for them to do their advocacy work because of the reprisals and the challenges that they faced. Um, but their role is very key because, for instance, in terms of dealing directly with the victims of torture, uh, most organizations, you know, have um, have such um, a unit or, or, or offer enough assistance to torture victims, for instance, like in Philippines, Organization like Balai Rehabilitation Center, for instance, play an important role to um, to to provide support and assistance to to victim to to, to wow. victims of torture. Um, and uh, contrast, for instance, in Indonesia, also di deal directly with the victims, and they also are very vocal in their work in terms of. Um, Com, you know, calling to the state to 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 end the use of torture and treatment. So the, the 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 voice of the civil society is very important and key to keep the momentum alive that torture and ill treatment must be ended. And of course, we also need public who are more aware and um, uh, you know and aware that um, you know torture is not the way to solve uh, some of the issues uh, that they might disagree with. For instance, terrorism uh, or um, uh, criminal convicts, you know, the use of some of, some of the measures that were used, for instance, um, to interrogate or to um, investigate to in, to interrogate terrorist suspects for instance could be really um, you know um, could amount to torture and treatment and I think sometimes public opinion is very important to ensure that you know we're not supporting this kind of measures as the way to address issues like terrorism for instance in fact the whole um, you know, there's a there's a whole fallacy about how the ticking bomb scenario is actually real, and um, I think we uh, public needs to to be more aware and um, and realize this. I think I still believe that international pressure is still is still important. I know that in the current situation, perhaps there is some skepticism about international pressure, um, as countries tend to be a bit more. Uh, you know, nationalistic, and uh, yeah. you know, uh, and this is this is a scenario that is even more real than ever in my region. Uh, I see international organizations should be aware of this scenario and try to be more innovative in in uh, supporting, you know, efforts to translate international principles into something that is much more uh, accessible or appealing to to the domestic. Uh, context or the, the, the society the na in the national context. I think it's, it's very important to do that we, we, yeah, we, like for instance, APT, we, we're an international organization, um, but we always try to make sure that, you know, um, we, we, what we say or, you know, what the, whatever we're doing, it has to relate to the context and the situation in the country because then, how would you convince people about um, the weight or the meaning of what you're trying to advocate for, especially when it comes to human rights, uh, if you just do it in a very sanitized, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. In a, yeah, so I think it's very important uh, for that to be done. And I always, always stress on the importance of um, bringing more positive narrative positive narrative of human rights from the international organization. It's very important because 
uh, you see human rights work or human rights activists or human rights defenders are being um, attacked, you know, if I may call that, uh, for, you know, for representing some, um, uh, you know, external forces or threat. So it's very important to, to sort of, um, I'm not saying retaliate, but sort of to, you know, to, to, to address this by bringing more um, positive narrative about human rights. And in my work, even though I'm, a, I'm a, um, legally trained and I'm a program officer, I'm also a comic artist. And I try as well to use my skill as much as I can to, to introduce more positive uh, human rights narratives or international principles through the comics that I draw and translate in the local context, because I think we need to also think of different mediums and different ways to reach out to people to, to get the message across and not just relying on, um, you know... Um, institutions. Yeah, institutions, uh, difficult human rights jargons or um, uh, very bombastic or, <laughs> you know, um, principles. We need to make, you know, make it more accessible for, for, for people to understand. Um, so recently, for instance, we, um, we were together with the Human Rights Commission in Malaysia to launch uh, a small initiative that we call Cartoonists Against Torture, where we try to bring cartoonists together, not only from the country, but also around the region who are interested to be part of this uh, movement to develop and to produce um, some cartoons or comic stories on the issue of torture. Uh, and these materials hopefully could be used to spread more messages about the importance of combating torture in our life and, you know, um, ultimately, yeah, for a free torture world.